college, a group of my friends decided to get together and go on a summer camping trip. Now most of you know already how much I like the hot weather, but we were looking for something to do over a long weekend, and so we decided that the camping trip was going to be our thing. The first night, we pitched our tents, and we went swimming, and we cooked dinner over an open fire, and we sweated our way through the night. But the second day was awful. I mean, even after a day of canoeing and being in the water and at 9 o'clock with 90 plus degree temperatures, we just decided that we were done and we packed up our stuff and we headed for a nearby motel. Now when we arrived, it didn't take me long to start asking the question, how in the world do they keep this place open? I mean, from the outside, it was obvious that we were going to run into some problems, but it only got worse when we got inside, right? I mean, from... <laughs> The moment that we walked in, Steve and my college roommate and I were sharing a room and the door wouldn't lock. As we were unpacking for the evening, we spotted a couple of roaches on the ceiling. There was a terrible odor coming from the bathroom, which we discovered later was a backup in the sewage trap. The air conditioner worked only enough to keep things at a muggy 78 degrees in the room, and there were stains all over the bedspread. I mean, it was awful. And to make matters worse, we were miles away from anywhere else to stay. I came into that motel room in a bad mood, and as I laid in bed that night with one eye open, waiting for a critter or an insect to crawl across me, wondering what in the world caused the stain and why I wasn't outside sleeping in, on the ground in 80 degree heat instead of in this nasty motel room, I grumbled. I grumbled a lot. I was not happy at all with the turn that this weekend had taken. My weekend had that I had taken the weekend off to go on this trip with my friends to spend time with the guys and it was ruined and I was not happy about it at all. But when we got up the next day after we packed our cars to head back to campus, Steve and I watched the rest of the guys drive away and we decided to stick around for breakfast at the local diner. We walked in the diner door and, and we sat at the counter as we were going to sit at the counter there was an old guy there who, was, who looked like he hadn't had a bath in days and smelled like it and was scarfing down a breakfast plate as fast as he could. Now the only two seats in the entire restaurant just happened to be at the diner counter and so we went up and we sat right next to this guy. We didn't even have time to pick up our menu before Bobby introduced himself to us and started chatting us up. I never at this point in my life met a more friendly and more genuine guy and as we talked and as our breakfast arrived he told us the story of how he, he was living in the motel at which we just stayed the, the night begrudgingly in, and how grateful he was for that place. Now, he hadn't had running water in several days because the owner needed to fix the problem, but he wasn't complaining for what he was paying. He explained that a few years ago he had lost his job and, and the company that he was working for had downsized, and so he was no longer able to work, and in his pursuit of another job, his wife and his daughter got tired of waiting and just up and disappeared one day. They just left. He was devastated. But he kept looking, he kept digging, he kept trying to find that new job. And the job market in that little community wasn't very much. He didn't have the resources to pick up and to move somewhere else, and so he kept looking, he kept calling, he kept hoping, and in the meantime, he stumbled upon this little motel where he cleaned rooms and fixed things the best that he could with the tools that he had available in exchange for a place to stay. And that was the life that Bobby lived every single day. But through all of that, Bobby wasn't angry, and he wasn't bitter, and he wasn't depressed. Quite the opposite, actually. He was, as he said, grateful. Grateful genuinely. Grateful for what he had and for what he didn't have to go through. And near the end of our conversation, Bobby got up from the counter, turned to Steve and me, shook our hands, and said, God bless you. And as Steve, or as Bobby walked away from that counter, as he slipped out of the restaurant, I immediately felt convicted. This man, who had nothing, had joy that it seemed he had no business having. He was unshaken by the fact that he had next to nothing to his name, and he was able to carry himself as if he had everything. And I had just spent the last 36 hours of my life complaining about how hot it was and how dirty everything was and how nothing was going the way that I wanted it to go. And that day I learned a really valuable lesson. There's a huge difference between being happy 
and being joy-filled. And I needed that lesson. Because in those moments, I was living like I was neither. And I was being a terrible witness to all the things that God had done for me. How many of you know that the Bible never promises, not one time ever, that you will be happy? The Bible doesn't promise that you're going to be happy. The first time people hear that, I think they, they, they're shocked. Mostly because we spend our whole lives pursuing happiness and assuming that as long as we go to church and read the Bible occasionally and pray every once in a while and do most of the right things, that we'll be genuine, genuinely, generally happy. That God owes us that much. But the Bible never promises that you're going to be happy. And in fact, your pursuit of happiness often leads to more pain. See, happiness is an emotion that rests on your circumstances, and honestly, we've all been alive long enough to know that our circumstances shift constantly. When things aren't going the way that we want them to go, when we're free from suffering, when we're financially secure, at least a little bit, when, we're, when our relationships are good, we're genuinely, genuine, generally, easy for me to say, happy. But what happens when those things aren't true? What happens when I'm suffering and going through stuff? What happens when I'm dealing with the loss of somebody or something important in my life? What happens when I'm trying to recover from the wreckage of, of a life that I've created because of my own sin or my own addiction or maybe even that of somebody else? What happens then? When happiness is what we're seeking and when it's all that we're seeking, in moments like that we spiral out of control into places we never wanted to go doing things we never wanted to do and instead of the things and the circumstances of our lives changing for the better they most often change for the worse and while guys like my friend Bobby have every reason to dread the day to day of their life there was something about Bobby that was different and that something was joy see Bobby understood something that you and I need to learn today my friends Joy doesn't depend on our situation or our circumstance. Joy depends on God. It's not something that we can earn or get or work harder for. It's something that's given to those who trust in God. God places joy in the lives of those who choose to follow Him. That's why in Philippians chapter 3, in the very first verse, Paul can say with confidence to his friends, whatever happens, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, Rejoice in the Lord. Whatever happens, when we trust God's promises and His hope, we experience joy in every circumstance. Not just when things are going the way that we want. Not just when we have everything that we think we need. Not just when things are easy and comfortable, but in every single circumstance. Because it's not based on what's happening to you or around you. It's based only on who is living inside of you and what He has already done for you. You may not always be happy, but you cannot shake joy. You can pursue it, you can cultivate it, you can grow it, but when the Spirit of God is living inside of you, joy is born, and when joy is born, nothing stands in its way. Bobby was living proof of that, and so was Paul. Paul was living in chains, on the edge of his seat, his life hanging in the balance, and in the middle of all of that, his, he is rejoicing, and he's calling other people to rejoice with him. Paul has joy despite the terrible circumstances that are staring him in the face because Paul had his eyes where they belonged. For Paul, Jesus was not just the source of all joy, but he was also the object of and the reason for joy. Paul could rejoice in the Lord no matter what because he knew that no matter what, who Jesus is and what he had done and what he was going to do was bigger than anything he was ever going to have to endure in this life. No matter what he was going through right now, no matter what he might go through at some other point, Jesus was bigger. He could look forward to something that was bigger than his suffering, bigger than his fear, bigger than his chains, bigger than his death. And that something would bring a deeper, purer, sweeter, more lasting pleasure and gladness than anything that the world had to offer. Jesus was and is all of that. To Paul, to you, to me. He's the object of all joy, and when our eyes remain on Him, our joy will not be shaken. But something happens when our eyes aren't on Him. 
When Jesus is not the object of, when he's not the reason for, when he's not the source of, then we don't really have joy. He's the source and the object and the reason for joy. And if he is not your focus, then you are not chasing joy. Because the greatest obstacle to joy in your life is the pursuit of happiness. Say, what? You heard me right. When you're chasing happiness, you're chasing what's temporary, what's circumstantial. And when you do that, you are setting yourself up for a life filled with misery. Now, we still live in a world that's marred by sin and brokenness. And you don't have to look very far to see that. I mean, turn on your TV. We haven't stopped talking about a pandemic for four months. We're fighting about which lives matter and which ones don't. We're in a politically charged climate. People are still dying of overdoses every single day. And depression and anxiety are wreaking havoc in the lives of people like never before. Though Jesus has already died and he's already risen again in victory, we have not yet experienced the fullness of that victory. And as a result, the world continues to strive to survive. To do whatever it takes to make it. And like the undertow of the river current, that sin and that brokenness and the pursuits of the world threaten to sweep us under with them. If we're not careful. Think about it for a minute. I mean, it all looks pretty appealing, doesn't it? Money and fame and power and status and material things. We spend a whole lot of time and energy trying to get more and better. And if you struggle with that, I want you to hear me. I'm not, I'm not judging you because I struggle too. I want people to notice me. I want people to recognize me. I want people to need me even though I don't need or deserve any of it. Even though I'm here to please only him and nobody else, I like to be needed and I like to be recognized. I struggle just like you. But I think I need to ask somebody who's watching today this question. What do you need that for? And when is enough enough? I mean, that's really the problem, isn't it? That enough never seems to be enough. We keep looking for that next thing, that next toy, that next relationship, that next degree, that next high, hoping that the next will be the thing that satisfies, and we keep discovering that the next is never enough. And it never will be, ever. But as long as we stay on the hamster wheel of the world's game of life, we're going to be distracted from the main thing. The source and the object and the reason for our joy, Jesus, is pushed to the back burner of our life. And when that happens, we will never find joy. And if we ever had it, we will certainly lose it. Paul clearly understood it. And that's because he had been there too. I mean, for a long time, he thought he found what he was looking for. He spent his whole life earning his way to good enough. He pursued all the degrees. He wanted the pedigree. He took great pride in living out the law to the letter, but it was never enough, and it set him up to live a, a judgmental, discontented life that led to pain not just for him, but for others. Look at the things he once celebrated, beginning in chapter 3 and verse 4. He says, I could have confidence in my own effort if anybody could. Indeed, if, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more, he says. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who, who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law, and I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Paul spent a long part of his life chasing pedigrees and rituals and status and accomplishments and he thought they would fill the void that he wanted to fill. But there was never enough. And I want you to hear something this morning. Under the pressure and the weight of meeting the world's expectations or trying to have the world meet yours, if you're not careful, if you aren't guarding your heart, your joy will be taken from you because nothing steals our joy like getting caught up in the rat race of a life of trying to have more and to achieve more and to be more. When Paul discovered that Jesus was the source and the object and the reason for joy, everything changed. 
He no longer celebrated the things that mattered to him before. The things that had been important to him weren't, weren't important any longer. And he uncovered the truth that his heart had been searching for all along. You can absolutely have joy in every circumstance, no matter what. Listen to what he says, starting in verse 7. He says, I once thought these things were valuable, but I now consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with Him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law, but rather I become righteous through faith in Jesus Christ. For God's way of making us right with Him depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised Him from the dead, and I want to suffer with Him, sharing in His death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. What's the difference? The difference was this. Paul discovered that Jesus was the source. Jesus had become the object. Jesus was the reason for his joy and nothing, no matter what, could stand in the way of his rejoicing. No pedigree, no degree, no status, no chains, no nothing. Can you say that? I mean, it's easy to want to know Christ and to experience the power that raised him from the dead. But what about suffering with him? What about sharing in his death? Are you ready to do that? I mean, if he really is the object and the source and the reason of your joy and for your joy, then no pain and no suffering and no status and no degree and no circumstance that comes against you will ever matter. It can't shake you. It can't take away your joy. Because he's got this. And he's got you. My friend Bobby got that. Paul got that. Do you get it? I mean, can you rejoice in every circumstance, not because you love what's happening to you, but because you know He's got this? Because you know that because of Jesus, because of His death and resurrection, what I see in front of me is not all there is to see? Something greater is coming along? I want to give you three very quick things that you can begin to do right now that will enable you to experience joy no matter what. Here's the first. Submit your will to God. Pastor's favorite word in the whole world is surrender. Dan makes fun of me all the time. This week I was reading the story in 1 Samuel 15 about Saul being rejected as the king. And Samuel is challenging Saul about his behavior. And this is what he says to him. He says, what's more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen. Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. And so because you have rejected the command of the Lord, He has rejected you as king. At the end of the day, Saul, Saul was so busy doing things his own way and living out his own will that it led to destruction for him. He lost the throne, and eventually he took his own life because he could never get past having things his own way. Friends, I know it sounds strange at first, but can I just tell you that until you stop trying to do things in your own strength, until you stop trying to do things in your own power and let God do what God does best, you are never going to experience joy. You won't. God will never force His way into your life. He will never force His way and His will on you ever. But it is only Him that can fill you with joy. That's it. And when you keep doing all the things your way, instead of gaining everything you think you'll gain, you'll lose everything you never thought you could. When you submit your will and your way to His care, you find and you grow your joy. And when you don't, you kill it. You have to submit your will to Him daily. And you do that by living out this daily commitment, a commitment that Jesus made Himself in the scariest moment of His life, not my will, but yours today, God. Not just praying that prayer, but doing that prayer every moment of every day. You've got to submit your will. Here's the second thing. You've got to renew your mind. We talk often about this principle in New Hope Church, but I want to be really clear about this right now. As long as you allow negative thoughts to dominate your life, you will never experience joy ever. 
I get that it's easy to go, woe is me when things are a struggle, when you're going through the hardest part of your life, but never forget this. What you think, you become. It's true. What you think leads to what you do. As, as long as you continue to believe the lies, to buy into the glasses half full, and that you can and that it won't, you won't and it never will. Romans 12 says that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. When the way that we think begins to change, so does the way that we behave. We have new levels of faith and trust in God when we think differently, and that only leads to good things in our lives. Now, the only way you begin to have new thoughts is to replace the old ones with God's Word. I mean, think of how differently you'll view the world if you believe that you are a masterpiece and not a misfit. Think of how much joy you can experience when you believe that God has only the very best in mind for you, even when all that you think you see is the very worst. What if you start believing the Word of God? Because when it does, and when you do, everything changes and you cultivate the joy that God has already placed in your heart through His Spirit. Here's the last thing you have to do. You've got to learn to simplify your life. We talked about the pursuit of happiness a few moments ago and how it impedes your joy. What if your life wasn't about all the stuff? What if instead of chasing all of that, you focused your time and energy on downsizing in every area of your life? What if you had less material stuff? What if you had less emotional baggage? What if you were holding on to less unforgiveness? What if your life really were simpler? What if you forgave those who've hurt you and, and you weren't carrying that around with you anymore? What if you decided that you could live with one less room or one less car or with one less pair of shoes or one less meal out every single week? What if you didn't have to be constantly busy or entertained? What if you weren't so focused on comparing yourself to others and you stayed in your own lane? What do you think would happen? I believe that the joy that God has already placed in your heart would multiply. I believe you'd find yourself content in ways you never thought possible, but you have to let go of some stuff. You need to simplify your life. Jesus came that you would have life, that you would have it abundantly, and that abundant life involves joy. Joy unspeakable, no matter the circumstance. And you can have that with the Spirit of God living inside of you. What's standing in the way? What are you doing or not doing in your life that's standing in the way of joy unspeakable filling you up no matter what you face? I want to invite you to lay that on the altar right now. Just put it down before the Lord. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for a joy unspeakable even in the midst of pain and trials and persecution even when things aren't what we want them to be or think that they should be. Thank you that you love us, that you sent your Son to die for us so that we could have that abundant life. Come and live inside of us and fill us with joy unspeakable so that no matter what we're in, no matter what we're up against, we will never, ever, ever be without your joy again. And help us to live like it in every circumstance and situation we find ourselves. In Jesus' name.